This is going to be an overview of the book of Judges. And if you want a book with some strange things in it, then this is the book, book for you. You know, they have the show called Stranger Things. I've never seen it. I don't know if there's actually strange things in the show, but I'm assuming there are. But I doubt that it gets any stranger than what happens in the book of Judges. I'd say the strangest stories are in this book. And in this book, you see the law of human collapse. A man doesn't get better. He gets worse and worse and worse with time. And in this book, you have Israel repeatedly going into apostasy and then being taken over by their enemies as a judgment from God for that apostasy. And then they finally cry to the Lord, and each time the Lord raises up a deliverer for them. And these are the judges, and these judges or deliverers picture the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, the Bible is a picture book. Pretty much everything in it shows you the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord is referred to as a judge in, in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy 4.1, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And he's also referred to as a deliverer. In 2 Corinthians 1, 9 through 10, it says, But we had the sentence of death on ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from dead, raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So he's our Savior, he's our Deliverer, and he's our Judge. And now let's look at Judges 2, 15 through 16. And these verses show us what this book is about. It says, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. So that's what this book is about. It's about Israel going into apostasy, Israel getting judged by God and getting put into the hands of wicked men for doing that. And then the Lord raises up a deliverer, a judge, to deliver them. And now let's look at these judges and learn some things from them after israel's first apostasy they were conquered by mesopotamia and othniel as the judge or deliverer and in judges one you see where othniel is given a bride after a great victory in judges 1 12 through 13 it says and caleb said he that smiteth kirjath sefer and taketh it to him will i give axa my daughter to wife and othniel the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. So this shadows the Lord Jesus Christ because he got his bride after a great victory on the cross. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ had a great victory and got a bride, so did this judge. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that's us. We are the bride. Also, Othniel's name itself means Lion of God. And Jesus Christ is referred to as a lion himself. In Revelation 5.5 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto, me, saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Uh, the next time Israel does evil again in the sight of the Lord, they are taken over by the Moabites uh, for judgment against their apostasy. And in Judges three twelve through fifteen, it says, "And the children of evil, and the children of Israel, did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto." him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees so the children of Israel served Eglon 
the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. And Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel, sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And now notice the long-suffering of God and the forgiveness of God. He raises them up a deliverer yet again. This guy Ehud. And then in verse 16 it says, But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So the dagger in Ehud's hand would represent the sharp two-edged sword of a Hebrews 4.12, which says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Also in Revelation 2.12, Jesus Christ is referred to as the one who has the sharp sword with two edges, just like Ehud. And then in Revelation 19.15, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming to deliver Israel with a sharp two-edged sword, just like Ehud does here in this story. And Romans eleven twenty six once again, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ in Israel, it says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So once again, Jesus is the Deliverer. But now let's continue with this story Judges three seventeen through 20. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him, and Ehud came unto him. And he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have... A message from God unto thee, and he arose out of his seat. So notice Eglon and his men think that Ehud has something good and pleasant for them, a present. Uh, similar to how the devil and devils thought they were accomplishing something good when Jesus Christ died on the cross. But then, in verse 21, it says, And Ehud put forth his left hand, and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. So he sticks that dagger into Eglon's belly, and the dirt comes out. So here you have Ehud killing the leader, the head of the enemy, and by doing this it results in the defeat of the enemies. And that dagger represents the word of God, and, went, and it went right into Eglon's belly. And he met his bitter end, literally. Because the word of God is bitter on your belly, and that little dagger is a type of the word of God. And Revelation 10.10 10 says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And when you give someone the gospel or give someone any part of the Bible, it's bitter sometimes. So this could be a picture of someone using the word of God and it being bitter to them. And next you have Shamgar who delivers Israel. And Judges 3.31 it says, And after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox gold, and he also delivered Israel. And this is a mighty man. If he kills 600 with an ox goad, who doesn't love to see one man fight hundreds of men? This is portrayed in all the martial arts movies. And there's just something about seeing a guy so tough that he can beat up everybody at once. But something about Shamgar is not that he beats up everybody at once. It's that he defeated the enemy with an unlikely and unique weapon, an ox goad. Jesus Christ defeated the enemy with a weapon that they didn't see coming, and that is the cross. And Colossians 2.15 says, And having 
spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. But in the verse before that, it said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then it says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So the Lord triumphed over innumerable devils, and the devil, when he was on the cross, he used an unlikely weapon to defeat the spiritual wickedness in high places. And next you have Deborah and Barak. And in Judges 4, 2 through 4, you have Deborah as a judge, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelled in Harosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And many will say that since Deborah was a judge and a prophetess, that this means we can have women preachers and pastors. But realize the book of Judges shows the law of human collapse, and it was a time when men did that which was right in their own eyes. And the Apostle Paul also tells us in his epistles for the church that women aren't to be in authority. It says in 1 Timothy 2.12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So I'm going to take that clear verse there from Paul and let that interpret the rest of the Bible. These clear verses. And that's not the only one. Also notice at the time of Deborah that men were acting like women. They were weak and afraid. Look what Barak says to Deborah in Judges 4, 6 through 8. It says, And she went and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Nephtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Nephtali, and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river of Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So he's like, Deborah, if you go, then I'll go. But if not, then I'm not going. So he's, see how he's not as manly as he should be. And since Barak said that, Sisera would be sold into the hand of a woman. Judges 4, nine said, And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And the woman she's referring to was Jael, who ended up stabbing Sisera in the head with a tent peg, and he became dead as a hammer. Picturing the Antichrist getting a head wound and the bride crushing the head of the devil under their feet with Christ at the second coming. In Romans 16, 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. But then you, the next one you have is Gideon. And notice a great similarity between Jesus and Gideon. Before Gideon starts his work for the Lord, the Lord has a prophet show up first in Judges 6, 7 through 8. It says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Now just like a prophet came before the work of Gideon, John the Baptist comes before the Lord begins his earthly ministry so Gideon illustrates for us Jesus Christ in many ways the spirit was on Gideon just like he was on Jesus Christ as it says in Judges 6 34 but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet now look at verse 36 and Gideon said unto God if thou wilt save Israel by mine hand as thou hast said so notice that God saves Israel by his hand. Who does that remind you of? 
Well, Romans eleven twenty six, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, you shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. Gideon would be a savior to Israel. Also notice the phrase there in Judges 6, by mine hand. Save Israel by mine hand. And Zechariah 13, 6 says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. When Jesus was crucified, his hands were they nailed in his hands. Next, you're going to see miracles happen for Gideon, just like Jesus himself performed miracles. And in Judges 6, 37 through 40, it says, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. So just like a miracle was performed during Gideon's work for the Lord, the Lord's ministry was accompanied by miracles. And in Judges chapter 9, you have a man named Abimelech. And this guy is a bad dude. He is a type of the Antichrist. Judges 9.52 says that Abimelech came into the tower and fought against it and went hard into the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head. And remember that we're going to crush Satan the Lord is going to crush Satan under our feet shortly. Remember that. And we are the bride. <clears throat> so a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed away, every man into his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his seventy brethren. So just like Abimelech gets a head wound, the Antichrist also has a head that is wounded to death, as you read in Revelation 13. And you'll see that with a lot of bad men in the Bible. They get their head wounded to picture that. And Notice, just like Sisera had a head wound from a woman jail, Abimelech has his head wounded by a woman, showing how the Lord is going to use his bride to crush Satan under his feet shortly, as it says there in Romans 16. But now we move on to the next judge, a woman named Tola. Or, not a woman. This is a man named Tola, a judge. And Judges 10, 1 through 2 it says, And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelled in Shamer in Mount Ephraim, and he judged Israel twenty and three years, and died and was buried in Shamer. So the Bible doesn't say much about this man Tola. But if you look up the meaning of his name, it actually means worm. And do you know what the Lord describes Jesus Christ as on the cross? In Psalms 22, 6, it says, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head. So Tola, a judge, a deliverer, shows us Jesus Christ through his name. And then in Judges 10, 3, and 4, and it says, and after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. So it also doesn't say much about Jair, but his name means he shines. And you know good and well who really shines. In John eight twelve. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, 
people shall have the light of life. Malachi 4, 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So Jesus is the one that shines. Moving on to chapters 11 through 12, we see Jephthah, another great type of Christ. He is a judge. He is a deliverer. In Judges 11, 1 and 2, it says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah, and Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So just like Jephthah was rejected by his brethren, so was the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like they rejected Jephthah because he was born of fornication, they also rejected Christ, saying that he was born of fornication. Even though he was not, he was virgin-born, and Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost before Joseph had laid with Mary. But look what they said to Jesus in their rejection of him. In John eight forty one. he says, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. So notice how they throw a sling there, make it seem like Mary had been with someone before she was married, and that's how Jesus came about. But that's a lie because he's virgin born. So you have a similarity there between Jephthah and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Judges 11.3, it says, Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. So the same kind of people that gathered around Jephthah is the same kind of ones that gathered around Jesus Christ. And Luke 5, 30 through 32, it says, But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, Jesus had the outcast, the sinners hanging around him, just like Jephthah. Now, Judges eleven twenty nine through 32 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, just like it came on Jesus Christ. And he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail... Deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands. Then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And the first one, when Jephthah gets home to walk out the door, was Jephthah's own daughter. It says, And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. So this puts you in mind of the father sending his only begotten son. As the little girl here was Jephthah's only daughter, and he has to offer her up just like the father sends his only begotten son and offers him up to get a victory because Jesus offered himself on the cross and it says in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty seven, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ now with that being said although it might illustrate somewhat what the father did with the son Jesus Christ it wasn't a good vow on the part of Jephthah but this is the book of Judges where every man does what is right in his own eyes. And God can use something bad and show us something good like he does here. But now finally we get to Samson who is the judge and deliverer for Israel who are now conquered by the Philistines. And Samson is probably the greatest type of Christ out of all the judges. And as you know, Samson is the strongest man in the Bible. However, he had a weakness and his weakness was women. A sinful weakness is something the Lord didn't have. So Jesus Christ was sinless and is still sinless. So no type 
in the Bible is a perfect match for the Lord Jesus Christ because all these men in the Bible are sinners, but the similarities are still there. In Judges 13, 3 through 5, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, pray thee and drink not wine nor strong drink. And eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver, to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So notice how Samson reminds us of Jesus Christ, because both of them had an angel foretell their birth. In Luke 1, 30 through 32, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. <clears throat> so, both had a angel foretell their birth, and both of them had a miracle birth. You've seen where Samson's mother was barren, she couldn't have children. But the Lord performed a miracle, and you know that Jesus' mother, Mary, was a virgin. Yet a virgin conceived, both had a miracle birth. Both Samson and the Lord Jesus Christ have something on their shoulders. In Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting father the the everlasting father the prince of peace so both have something heavy on their shoulders judges 16 3 it says and samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them bar and all and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before hebron the lord jesus christ has strong shoulders much stronger than samson he can carry all of his saints through anything all at one time. He also had a cross on his shoulder that he carried for you. And both have a Gentile bride. Samson has a Gentile bride named Delilah. And the Lord has a Gentile bride, the church. Also notice she will sell out Samson for silver. Delilah sells him out for silver. Jesus Christ has a Gentile bride, the church. And before his death, he gets sold out for 30 pieces of silver by Judas. So you see the similarity there. As it says in Mark, or Matthew 26, 15, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold out for, for that. And both Samson and Jesus make Israel jealous. As you see in Judges 14.3 where Samson bothers his father and mother because he's going to take an uncircumcised Philistine wife, it says, or a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines. It says, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So he made his, he was making his father and mother jealous, just like Israel is jealous of the Gentiles because of God going to the Gentiles. In Romans 11, 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall is coming to the Gentiles. Salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So just like Samson took a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines, and that made some of Israel jealous, the Lord makes Israel jealous by going to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And next thing is lions are no match for either Samson or the Lord Jesus Christ. Judges 14, 5 through 6, it says, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. 
And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. The son noticed this is a roaring lion, and Peter tells us that the devil is a roaring lion walking about singing whom he may devour, but he, yet this lion was no match for Samson. And notice he didn't have anything in his hand when he killed him, just like in the book of Matthew when the devil tries to go against the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So Jesus defeated the devil many times, and he didn't have, need anything in his hand. He had the word of God in his mouth, just like Samson didn't have anything in his hand. And he defeated a roaring lion just like the Lord does. Now, next, both prepare a marriage feast. In Judges 14.10, it says, So his father went down to the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for he so used the young man to do. Just like the Lord in Revelation 19.9 talks about a marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to have a great marriage feast one day with the Lord one day. And Samson was definitely a character... That really stuck out to me in the Bible. He killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass, much more deadly than Jet Li and Jackie Chan or Tony Ya or Donnie Yen or Steven Seagal or John Claude Van Damme, Sylvester Stallone, or any of those tough guys you see in the movies. But and Samson tied like three hundred foxes' tails together, lit them on fire, and burned up the cornfields of the Philistines. And there's just so many other stories in this book that are very interesting that I didn't even mention. It's really worth a read. And at Samson's death, he put his hand on one pillar and his other hand on another pillar and brought the whole building down on himself and the Philistines. And the men that he killed in his death was more than all throughout his time on earth. Just like Jesus Christ stretches out both arms on the cross and triumphed over innumerable principalities and powers. But this has been an overview on the book of Judges. I hope it's give you some interest in the Bible, specifically in the book of Judges, and I hope that you'll read it and just get out get as much out of it as you can.